Good morning, everyone. Hello. Hi there. Thank you for joining me today, this early, beautiful morning. And I'm happy that we have now uh, about 20 uh, participants. So hello, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Ghada Zain Abidin, uh, an assistant professor of ophthalmology in the University Hospitals from Egypt. And also, I am a professor at Motusami Virtual University of Postgraduate Ophthalmology in Malaysia. So welcome to our new course about clinical practice. I named it Mock Clinical Practice. First off, to whom this presentation, uh, everyone who is preparing for the exam, like the final FRCS exam from uh, Glasgow or any equivalent postgraduate uh, exams, but also uh, if you want to brush up your memory about uh, the clinical practice in order to like provide your patients with the best standard care, I think this presentation is for you. And also, if you are uh, an educator or like responsible or in charge of teaching, uh, maybe this uh, course is an inspiration for you. Uh, I posted this before, and I want to stress again the importance of taking notes and to be attentive. And uh, above all, you have to be interactive with me because this is uh, is all about you and your interactivity with me during this course. So there is a quote that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% taking really good news. It's uh, like a modified uh, quote from Thomas Edison, a quote that 1% is inspiration and 90% uh, is perspiration. So perspiration means sweating and hard working. So I'm expecting from your side to interact with me and to turn in any assignments I, that I posted during our T course. So why I'm stressing the importance of taking notes because right now you are you know listening to me okay and you are watching the slides and writing down your notes uh you are you are moving your hands so the more senses you use the more activated channels to your mind and you know you can focus better and you can gather a lot of information by using a lot of senses and maybe you, you may need to speak with me. Like if I say something uh, important, you can repeat it after me. Uh, of course, the, your mic is muted. So uh, I want to activate all your senses. All right. So throughout the course, our, uh, our presentation, if anything went wrong, uh, just uh, uh, type in the chat box and tell me, and you can, uh, you know, um, chat me, me privately. So if you have any comment, suggestion, or if I said something wrong or like a speak or a technical issue, just point this out, all right? So in today's presentation, uh, there will be like uh, some opening slides. Then uh, I will point out some reasons why we do miss some clinical science. So I, I use why we, so we, because we always, uh, this is something human. Sometimes we miss a science, Sometimes we do mistakes, so it's a, it's all about human. So uh, I will point out some of the causes why we do miss some clinical science, and this is important to overcome in your exam. Then I will highlight the general checklist that you can do with every clinical case before even uh, identify the diagnosis. Followed by uh, some slides about the study resources and some tips as an advice for your exam. Lastly, we have some uh, closing slides. Coming now to the opening slides, like an overview about this course. So I mentioned this before in uh, our uh, mock Viva practice that uh, whenever you set a goal, it should be uh, or recommended to be like a smart goal. What I mean by smart, so as to be specific, M for measurable, A attainable, or uh, relevant, and T time based. So, what is our goal right now? Most of you want to pass the exam, the final FRCS exam, uh, which is a good goal, of course, and it is attainable because many pass this exam and many will pass this exam. And uh, it is relevant to our job because uh, we want to improve our practice, we want to be uh, to get promoted. Uh, to have better chance to work abroad and so on but it should be time-based you don't want to say i want to pass the exam and that's it this is a kind of wish so you have to set a timetable like by 2024 20, um, i will pass the exam 
and you have to do some preparation and this preparation should be you know measurable it should be measurable so like uh, for one month, I will study Kaniski. That next month, uh, I will, um, uh, let's say, uh, practice uh, the clinical techniques. The last month, I will revise and study uh, with a study partner and uh, check the past can the experience. So you have to set a timetable, like a schedule for every step in order to achieve your goal, in order to pass from the first attempt. So you have to study smartly. And sometimes the time is against us. So you have to spend your time smartly as well. All right. And if you remember uh, early in this year, uh, I posted this before that uh, in our uh, virtual university, we set some goals uh, in order to practice VIVA uh, for the VIVA and the clinical exams. And uh, for the VIVA, we did the, together like four lectures, about seven hours. Um, try to scrutinize some uh, past very uh, candid experience and try to provide uh, the model answer for some of the questions. So I hope you can check them out. Coming now to the clinical and according to their, your vote, um, which exam part is more challenging? And of course, it is the clinical stations. And this is quite understandable because, you know, it's too fast. It's like 12 minutes for every station, I think for each station. and uh, you, you can't ask the patient, you can't take history. Uh, the examiner won't um, point to the area to be examined. So you have to think and examine quickly and swiftly in order to elicit the finds and then to be able to answer the follow-up questions. So it's tricky, especially if you are not in practice or um, your practice is not sufficient, or if you are working in a, like, um, a humble place with limited facilities or you see a small number of patients. So uh, for uh, this practice, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, before any exam, we have pre-clinical exam. So P here for preparation. So it's all about preparation and preparation is the key. And I, I mean by preparation, like uh, good preparation. Okay. And there is no such a thing that a difficult or easy thing, but whether you are prepared or not. So uh, I wrote here some uh, words that starts with, by letter P, so prepare, plan, practice, practice, practice. So all of Professor Moto says this, uh, says this, practice three times and uh, to be patient and perseverance also. And then um, you have the exam itself. So you have to be attentive, diligent, determined. So don't lose your face. Don't lose your hope. If you did wrong uh, or badly in one station, uh, make a fresh start to the next station. And finally, after you finish the exam, please provide us with the post experience because this is very helpful for us uh, as an educator and also for your peers. So as you can see, this is like a triangle inverted. Uh, the apex is down because it's all about the preparation. So you, pre you have to prepare like four months. The exam itself is like a few minutes. And then the post experience uh, won't take me, uh, won't take a lot of time actually. So um, to be go getter is a good thing, but to be also a like, giver is a wonderful thing. Regarding the post experience, uh, one smart method that uh, actually uh, I learned from one of um, our students that after she finished her exam, she uh, recorded, like after VIVA, she recorded the, her experience in the VIVA, and then after the clinical, recorded uh, her experience in clinical. So because it, you can easily forget uh, the exam uh, questions. So posting the voice notes uh, to yourself or to other person uh, is a quick and rapid method to like to share your experience. This is a, like a smart idea uh, I liked so much. So you mean imitate her in the future. So we have an exam coming soon in Delhi. So in September, we try to make as much as possible uh, Zoom meetings in order to help um, Delhi candidates, in order to like a guide to help them to excel in your exam or to succeed on your uh, in their exam. And as you know, uh, it always seems impossible until it's done. So uh, if you keep like, doing nothing and not studying, uh, you feel uh, you will have like, a, uh, you feel this is a big task, it's not achieve, it's uh, not achievable. But if you start uh, right now, 
everything um, by times will come easier and easier. And um, we want you at the end of this course to feel that the clinical techniques and the clinical station is not that hard. It's not impossible. All right. Because uh, you have to practice very well the clinical techniques because the examiner will know. So the examiner will know if you are like doing this uh, like on a daily basis, if you are a skillful, you know, dexterous practitioner, or if you are just uh, practice this test for a couple of times. So for, for me as a strabismologist, I can spot easily if uh, someone is doing the cover test on a regular basis or if they are like just uh, learn it uh, a short time before the exam. It's very easy. Uh, we try to do like Popeye, so uh, we have to uh, to practice well. Of course, you need to eat a healthy diet and to uh, get enough sleep, of course. But as you know, um, the brain's food is reading and studying. All right. So we have to nourish our brains by studying and by practicing in order to perform very well, very confidently and during the exam, and to be proud of yourself before everyone else. Um, I mean, you have to be, to be proud of, for yourself after finishing the exam, okay? And uh, the only person you, you have to blame after the exam, uh, if you perform badly, is yourself, actually, all right? Uh, I named this course as uh, boot camp uh, because the boot camp is actually a military uh, term uh, for practice, like discipline practice for New York roots, but also it means uh, like short, intensive, rigorous course of training that we ha I hope you can we can do together during the, the upcoming weeks. Uh, once more, this series aims at helping you to get the practice you need to success in your exam and more in your real practice. Okay, so sometimes we uh, will share with you some additional notes, uh, additional information. You might not be asked about this uh, in your exam because, you know, uh, in this exam, it's not in-depth assessment. Um, but we need sometimes in-depth knowledge in your practice, in our practice. So we have four stations, of course, as you know, anterior segment, posterior segment, uh, then oculoplastic and the eyelid. And finally, the most challenging one is, uh, for most of you, neuro and ocular motility disorders. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. So this, this is our time frame or like the titles for our course. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of points that we need to cover. Uh, and um, this is uh, our intro lecture today, uh, which is uh, like introduction about this course. In this course, I'm, I'm trying to like stress on some points. So let's uh, discuss some of these points. First of all, uh, we have something called do's and don'ts and videos. In order to, to do the clinical technique very well, uh, we will try to show you some videos, all right? So the technique, uh, suppose you are supposed to examine, uh, to do like causes evaluation or like pupil assessment. You have to know, at least you have to read about how to assess uh, the pupil. And then you have to watch someone doing it correctly. And then it's all about, uh, we have do's list and don'ts list. So for example, for do's list, you have to ask the examiner to turn off the lights of the room, all right? So this is like, you should ask for this. And we have don'ts list. For example, don't stand in front of the patient while assessing the pupil. So, uh, because now the patient is accommodating on you and um, uh, this is not a proper way to examine the pupil because you have to ask the patient to look at the distance. So this is ju just an example. So the proper examination techniques is all about some do's and some don'ts. So uh, for example, this is a kind of an old video uh, that uh, I shared before. I, I know that we have new members here, but this was like um, um, a mock um, practice about examination of the facial nerve. So uh, sometimes we will demonstrate the technique in the form of mock exam. So how to evaluate the, you know, uh, cranial nerve evaluations uh, is an important question. Uh, we have some important cranial nerves like this um, third, fourth, and fifth. And again, we have the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerve. 
So this was a mock exam uh, on how to examine the facial nerve. So you have to know the checklist for examining the facial nerve. What are the points to be assessed uh, while examining the patient? Uh, and of course, it starts by inspection because there is no place for history in the clinical exam, but we have to start by inspection in your examination. So uh, right now I'm trying to inspecting this volunteer. Uh, again, I this is uh, an exam tip. Uh, it's all about your performance in the exams. For some reason or another, you didn't able to pick the signs. You should at least show the examiner that you do the examination smoothly and swiftly. The, as I said before, the first step to do the proper exam, sometimes you are not lucky to pick all the signs. And this, of course, uh, risks your score in this patient. But at least you can show the examiner that you can do the technique properly. So after finishing the, the station, you may fail the station, but you are when you win the encounter, the occasion itself, because at least you show the examiner and you show to yourself you can able to do the technique properly. Then we have photo illustrations. Sometimes in order to um, make you understand some uh, some information, especially in strabismus, I can use some illustration because um, I'm not uh, like, feeling comfortable to post the videos of my patients. So sometimes I use illustrations in strobismus, you know, to understand some uh, tips regarding the, um, the abnormalities or some basics regarding the strobismus. So I want you, some of you, uh, or maybe all of you in your chat box, just to give a legend or like a comment, a comment on this uh, illustration. So what I am trying to show in this illustration. So this is will be le, your first interactivity during this uh, presentation. Can you know uh, what I'm trying to show you in this illustration? Yes, uh, exactly. So as um, as you said, this is it shows you a cross fixation phenomenon. All right. And again, uh, cover tests. Most candidates um, learn how to do cover tests nicely, but they don't able to you know, correlate the findings. I, I can use the illustration to demonstrate all the different possibilities for cover testing, especially we have different types of cover tests. Because, you know, I am strabismologist. This is my area of the strongest area. So I can, uh, I hope I can um, make you uh, understand these um, results and interpretation uh, later on in the course. And we have clinical scenarios because um, at the end of the day, you do the examination in order to elicit the signs in a case. So you have a case, you have a case with a, like a pathology, at least one pathology, but sometimes uh, there are a lot of signs in one patient, in one eye. So uh, in order to like um, show you some clinical scenarios, I will bring some photos and few videos in order to practice some common scenarios in each clinical station. So for example, uh, I think this is an old assignment. Uh, this is a case of hydrops in Kratoconus. And most of, uh, of who answered this quiz before um, notice this um, contact lens, but there is another contact bigger lens here. So uh, this is a, was a kind of practice to avoid um, uh, avoiding missing a contact lens because sometimes um, we examine the central cornea and we don't focus on the limbus. So, uh, you know, if you examine the limbus, the area just anterior to the limbus and inside the limbus um, in order to not miss uh, a contact lens like this. So this is uh, actually a photo of a piggyback contact lens uh, for keratoconus. Um, so we have like a hard contact lens because you know the RGP lens is smaller in diameter and we have a soft bigger lens here. So in order to again, to show you some cases, uh, we can use some uh, videos like in this one uh, that I posted recently. Hmm? But uh, sometimes it's difficult for me because I need to uh, hide the patient identity. So this was a case of, uh, as you answered before, Brown syndrome. Uh, so we will show you uh, as much as I can, more cases like real cases, photos or videos. 
And we have to cover also the checklist, as I mentioned before. Today, we will discuss a general checklist. But later on in the course, we will uh, go like, uh, like uh, one by one. So, for example, uh, if, I have, if I have a case of ptosis, okay? So, ptosis, um, suppose you are now in the oculoplastic station and you notice ptosis. So, you have to know what are the points to be assessed in ptosis and, and you have to do it like quickly as, as you can. But suppose uh, you noticed a ptosis, okay, this is a, a question for you. Suppose you noticed a ptosis in a neuro and ocular motility disorders station. So you have to think twice because this may be a pseudotosis, like in this case, actually. This is a case of hypotropia with pseudotosis. Okay, so um, usually if you notice a ptosis in neuro and ocular motility disorder station, you have to think whether it is pseudotosis due to hypotropia, or maybe there is ptosis and like um, exotropia, like in certain nerve palsy, okay? I will show you later on some clues um, because sometimes you can uh, expect the case from the title of the patient itself. So um, ptosis and oculoplastic station, usually it's like senile ptosis, mechanical ptosis, uh, congenital ptosis, like simple ptosis, or maybe Marcus gun, but Ptosis in ocular motility disorder gestation, you may expect the presence of um, strabismus or uh, like certain nerve palsy, something like this. Okay. Yes, uh, Dr. Apir, this is a case of uh, double elevator palsy, this case, hypotropia due to um, double elevator palsy. Actually, the, the, the new name for this disorder is uh, monocular elevation deficiency. Uh, we will uh, stress on the ptosis uh, and the strabismus uh, in this course, so don't worry. So uh, in the checklist, uh, we will give you some clues. Sometimes some candidates uh, know that their points to be assessed, but sometimes they make like disordering because whenever you have to do a test, you have to follow the order. There is some specific order. You have to do some uh, important ones first. So when it comes to this, for example, you have to assess the degree and elevator function because this, these two points are the most important points, okay? And we will give you a clue that while you are assessing, for example, the degree of this, you have to see if there is hypertrophy at the same time of not, or not, okay? Because if a candidate, for example, if this can, a candidate, like, be caught with this tosis, like he, he or she observe a tosis and start to assess the degree Okay, the elevator function, the Bell's phenomena. And lastly, they noticed hypotropia, or maybe they, they didn't notice hypotropia. Usually, they lose this patient. They lose, they fail in this patient. So, we'll give you some clues and some orders in order to uh, assess the most important and to rule out something like pseudotosis, for example. And while we uh, providing you with the list, for example, how? and why. So how we can assess the elevator function and why we assess the elevator function. What is the, um, the implication of doing each step? Why we need to assess the Bell's phenomena in a case of ptosis and how, okay? And sometimes I mention some relevant question to be asked. Again, this is beyond the scope of the FRCS exam because there is no history taking, but because you, we want you to practice well. So I may ask you what are the relevant relevant question to be asked in the history. And of course, once you pick the signs in the clinical exam, usually the next follow-up question is that your, what is your diagnosis or what is your differential diagnosis? What are the investigations in order to confirm your diagnosis? What are, what are the lines of treatments? So we try, we try to, um, to shed the light on the follow-up questions as well while discussing the checklist. I posted this before uh, many months ago. Uh, I, I asked you to like to buy a notebook, like a big one, and try to write down the steps to be assessed in every case, like in case of ptosis, how to assess the pupil, how to assess the uh, in a case of proptosis, and so on. I don't know if any of you uh, is following this advice or not. So what next? Here we will try also to uh, thank you. 
for those who are following my uh, advice. So we try also to practice questions and answer. And I think we are uh, we are doing this uh, um, over the last month uh, by by asking you to send the voice notes. So we will try to uh, to ask you and listen to your answer because you know in your exam you are you have to answer loudly. So it is not a written exam. So you have to speak to speak loud. So here I I, um, I wrote on this man, on this guy, who am I? So can someone answer who am I? Can someone in answer this question in the chat box? Someone uh, said the candidate. So I want a better answer. You know, I am a very demanding person when it comes to teaching So and assignments. So instead of, uh, yeah. So examinee is another synonym for candidate. I want a more, like more uh, engaging, so I want a more engaging answer instead of candidate or examinee. Okay, so I will answer it. This guy is you, okay? You, because one day of another, uh, one day you will be uh, such a guy. So uh, I want you to feel that you will be sitting or standing in this position one day. So you have to make initiative and interact with me and. Uh, study hard okay so uh, we will tackle some problems when it comes to answering some questions some of the uh, problems when answering a question that uh, i called it drop by drop so the examiner asks you a question but uh, you give like incomplete answer so the exam repeat also try to uh, repeat the question in a different way in order to allow you to answer more and more. This is, so you know the information, but somehow you are freaked out or you are stressed and you don't want to speak. You want to finish the exam as much as quickly as soon by giving the patient like drop by drop answer. But I want you to give like an articulate, uh, to be an articulate candidate and try to answer the question specifically and fully in one like in one uh, in one shot okay and of course this comes with practice everything mostly comes with practice so i will show you now um, uh, an example of uh, a voice note sent by um, a, a previous candidate okay he answered very well but we have just a little uh, comment on his answer all right. So I changed the pitch because uh, I don't want you to know who is speaking. So just listen carefully. And again, this is a practice for your listening because your exam, uh, during the exam, you have to work on your listening skills because sometimes if you don't, uh, if you don't listen carefully, you may give the examiner a wrong answer. Okay. So this is a kind of practice uh, for your listening. It's not an English uh, teaching, but it is like uh, practice for your exam. Uh, posterior segment station examination by indirect or thermoscope. Ferris case examined by indirect patient had uh, uh, extensive laser mark in superior and inferior arcade. Look like BDR. He said to examine the other eye. Other eye same. He said to him, I said the finding. He said, okay. No, no need to examine the periphery. Uh, he asked me about the BRP setting. Said to him, depend on the patient and his tolerability. He can do uh, 1,000 and up to 1,500. Said to me, okay, what is the power? What is the uh, spot size, uh, time, everything about BRP? All right. Uh, he said, the first case in posterior segment station, uh, he examined it by indirect ophthalmoscope and there was like extensive laser marks. And by the way, um, usually um, the posterior segment station is about laser marks. So you have to study the laser uh, very well. And the indications of laser, different scenarios for uh, like, you know, um, uh, when we use the laser, like uh, seal the retinal tear, like uh, this case, uh, proof of diabetic retinopathy. So you have to study this topic very well. All right. Uh, he noticed uh, like uh, PRP, extensive PRP. And uh, the next follow-up question, so he uh, listed the sign. So the next follow-up question was, what are the laser settings? So this is like the, the main question. 
what was the answer? He mentioned that the spot number, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And stop. The examiner repeat again. What about the power? What about the spot size? What about the duration? Okay. But so this is like costs you a lot of time, a few seconds. So listen carefully. What are the laser spotting uh, settings? You have to answer all these points in one shot, right? So he answered it, but like, uh, in a longer time. So this is uh, what I meant by drop by drop answer. And again, avoid long winded answer. If you don't know the answer, uh, say it frankly, I don't know the answer. So the, the examiner will move to the next question or will move you to the next patient. Uh, and again, we will practice avoiding like saying dangerous uh, or like fatal mistake when it comes to basics, because we will cover some basic basic points also during this course uh, and try not to lay up trouble for yourself okay don't mention something advanced so sometimes the question is about like something uh, general like um, basic but in your answer you try you will, like you trying to show off your knowledge so sometimes if you give the examiner uh, advanced piece the examiner maybe like uh, ask you more about this uh, advanced piece and then you you can't so try to be like answer just specifically to the question so since you will answer the questions loudly during your study your reading you have to speak loudly so i posted this book before um, and i want you at least you have to practice saying the words loudly And uh, this is uh, an old assignment. So in a voice note, describes the findings and your professional diagnosis, uh, keeping in mind the other eye has similar finding and mention the illumination technique in your answer. So this could be, uh, actually this was an assignment for Viva practice, but this is, I will show you right now, uh, 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 like a model answer, like uh, an articulate candidate Okay, who answered like fluently, confidently, and covered all the points uh, asked in the question. This is a slit lamp image of an eye where a bright beam of light is shown on one side of the limbus and a halo is seen around the rest of the limbus, illuminating the cornea. This method of examination is called a sclerotic scatter. It is used to examine the cornea and therefore I am unable to comment on the legs and conjunctiva. The cornea shows diffuse patterned opacity with intermittent clear areas. I would like to see the depth of the opacity by making a slit. Uh, the anterior chamber can be, uh, the depth cannot be appreciated. The pupil is dilated and the lens is clear. The fact that the other eye of this patient has similar picture, my provisional diagnosis is epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, also known as map dot fingerprint dystrophy or Cogan dystrophy. Uh, so by the way, um, uh, this actually happened. Uh, so uh, in anterior segment station, uh, there was like malfunction of the slit lamp. So this is a real story, okay? the candidate uh, couldn't make a slit okay because uh, this is a like malfunction of the slit lamp it's not the candidate's problem but it's, it's the slit lamp problems so what you expect so the the candidate stressed and uh, uh, somehow missed some signs um, so you can examine the cornea even without slit beam of course you need the slit beam okay to like to examine the layers to examine the anterior chamber reaction. So you need this little beam, but suppose that's that's what is available right now. You have a broad beam, okay? So you have to examine the cornea carefully, like from limbus to limbus, okay? And um, in order not to miss in, in a sign. And uh, I think the candidate also didn't point out the problem at the beginning. Um, and mentioned the problem that the slit, there is no slit limb to the examiner later on. So once there is a problem and you are sure there is a problem in the instrument, in the device, you have to point it early as, for, as possible to the examiner, okay? So uh, as a case uh, was like uh, an aphakia, 
okay so she was focusing on the aphakia and so on but she missed an early band keratopathy in the cornea um, so band keratopathy uh, you you all know this band keratopathy as the name implies in the form of band usually in the form of the band of band and it has like a creepy form of, um, or cheese um, what uh, like swiss cheese appearance but this is the uh, the full picture of band keratopathy. But band keratopathy, uh, when it's in early stages, it's only a faint opacity uh, inside the limbus with clear space between it and the limbus. So she missed the band keratopathy because she was freaked because of absence of slip beam. And she didn't examine the cornea from limbus to limbus. Okay. So um, supposedly uh, when we are uh, planning for the scuttle anterior segment station to come um, to discuss the different techniques for examining the cornea because cornea we can examine by slit beam we can use the sclerotic, sclerotic scatter like this one so we have different techniques for examining the cornea so in such a scenario when there is no slit beam you can use the other methods for eliminating the cornea and examining the cornea like indirect illumination sclerotic scatters and so on during the course, there will be like quizzes during the presentation itself, and we have also assignments. So the assignments uh, uh, will be men uh, will be mentioned at the end of the presentation, and you have to turn in the assignment. And we have like learning different line learning styles. Or like I said before, uh, you are can learn by listening. This is auditory. And by watching, this is visual, like observing your senior or your colleagues, and you try to imitate uh, what they are doing. And now uh, it's time to do it hands on, to practice it. So this is called kinesthetic. So this is the most effective way for deep learning uh, is to practice what you learn. And that's why um, later on the assignments will be in this form. You have to in a video demonstrate a technique or like a step in a point in a technique okay and that's why it is called the boot camp remember so uh, you know uh, you know this in the exam there is no in-depth questions but again they test your deep learning it's not always about rehearsal or, or memorizing the information because in clinical station, you have to correlate the findings in order to reach to a diagnosis, like a specific diagnosis or a reasonable, relevant differential diagnosis. What about the, this question mark at the center of this puzzle? It's about basics. Um, sometimes the candidates like some candidates have had like a, a huge amount of information, and some of them are advanced information. But sometimes basic questions do appear in the exam. Okay, if you did a mistake in a basic questions, actually this will, will like risk your score very much, or will affect your score badly. So, for example, uh, in Cairo, June this year, uh, there was a question but I guess it's uh, viva, about sen sensory and motor adaptation to squint. So remember in Kaniski, so, um, so I love Kaniski, we all love Kaniski, okay? But when it comes to some chapters like strabismus, it's like, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's needs a lot of, it needs a lot of modification. So strabismus from Kaniski uh, need to be, need to be updated anyhow. So uh, when you study strabismus from Kaniski, for example, some some candidates skip the first few pages, which is um which are which are about uh, which are about the basics. Okay, so the sensory and the motor adaptation is actually a basic question, and uh, actually it appeared in this exam, uh, I think in Viva. So we will highlight some basic questions in order to understand better uh, the clinical scenario or the problem. Okay. So uh, basics is not boring. And hopefully um, by the end of the course, uh, instead of being frustrated, maybe you, be, you will become like a confident uh, practitioner or learner. And again, uh, I, have, I have to do my job and you have to do your job. And hopefully uh, one day you will post your uh, letter that you, uh, you passed the exam.
or achieved your goal, whatever your goal is. Okay, so we are finished now, the first part or the first section of today's presentation. Right, which book is good uh, for strabismus? Uh, I don't know because a good book for strabismus uh, will be a lengthy book like American Academy. So I like American Academy, but it's too big. Okay. The next section in this presentation, why do we miss some clinical signs? So I highlighted some points here. Try to be attentive because this is uh, the one of the core points on today's presentation. Those who miss the clinical sign, again, who, who those who don't practice heavily, okay? Uh, first, uh, whole patient. What, what I mean by whole patient, because while you are studying, suppose this is from Kanisk, by the way, the picture is focused on the pathology. Like here, this is a case of ectropion, okay? So first, the, the, the image is cropped or like focused on the area to be uh, that, that shows the pathology. Uh, second, there is a legend, there is a comment below the picture, and you are reading the information regarding the picture. Okay. Third, um, the picture is actually uh, showing an obvious signs. So this is a case of like a severe ectropion, uh, maybe third grade or maybe fourth grade. And you know that it is captured in a in a profile in order to show you how much the ectropion is. But in reality, you will have to see a patient, a whole patient. The examiner will not point to the eyelid. Uh, the examiner will, will not uh, ask you to examine the eyelid. So in oculoplastic station, they, they, will, they will say, examine the patient, and that's it. And inspect the patient or examine the patient. They will not say, examine the eyelids. And again, the ectropion, for example, maybe like mild, first degree, so it may be not visible at distance, but if you come closer to the patient, you may notice the ectropion. So this is a cute child from distance. Do you notice any abnormality in his eyes? Whenever you see this emoji, it means there is a trick. There is a trap here, okay? And I'm trying to hide the identity of the patient in some kind of camouflage. So do you notice any abnormality in his eyes? By the way, uh, now I, 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 now I am getting along the pause. So in exam, don't pause for too long. If you are thinking, it's no harm to think out loud, okay? But try to like maybe uh, a short pause and then answer. Okay, excellent. So someone uh, nailed the question. So I, I like the first one because um, first he noted. Some of you noted that there is something abnormal in the left eye, okay? Like maybe misalignment. Some squint, someone said exotropia, someone said hypotropia. Someone noticed like uh, something in the lower eyelid, ectropion, like, uh, because you know, uh, this is like a distance photo. So you can say, I want a close up view. Okay, now I will provide you with a close up view. Now, what can you see? So I think someone answered it. Uh, this is actually a prosthesis. You know, you, if you come closer, you will notice that there is no luster. So suppose this is a real patient now. There is no luster. Uh, if you check the motility, there, mostly there is limited motility. And again, this kind of lower lid is commonly seen with artificial shell. And again, you will appreciate the artificial shell if you come closer to the patient. And that's why um, I brought this emoji to come closer to so don't stay away from the patient and again don't stay too close to the patient but at least you have to especially in oclo in i'm um, talking about the oculoplastic station you have to come closer in order to elicit such things okay actually the prosthetic eye is a trap one of the uh one of the traps so this uh, another case this is uh, we are now practicing by the way and this is an intro uh, lecture, but again, we are starting the practice. So actually, this is uh, it, it was in my exam in oculoplastic station. Actually, I faced a similar case in my exam. Okay, you may notice anything in this patient. So I came closer to the patient. And the examiner asked me to examine the patient in oculoplastic station, and I noticed uh, this split punctum. 
Okay. So the first thing came to my mind that the patient underwent pancreatoplasty or like three snip pancreatoplasty. The examiner somehow, okay, uh, I, I picked the sign, but actually my examiner in this station was like an angel. He said, is there anything in the surrounding area? But this is not, not always the case. Sometimes the examiner leave you astray. I said before, sometimes the examiners leave you without any clue, okay? But in my case, the examiner said, okay, the punctum is slit, but is there anything around, uh, in the surrounding area? So then I noticed like a faint line, very faint line of the external DCR, okay? So uh, you know, sometimes uh, when you do a DCR, you do intubation and sometimes the, uh, the tubes are, uh, are too tight and uh, resulted in a complication uh, known as cheese wiring of the punctum. So actually uh, this uh, case, uh, the case was um, underwent external DCR, but still the puncta uh, are slit because of the previous cheese wiring um, by tube, okay? So this is uh, one reason. The next reason, you didn't look for it. So some signs are present, but we didn't look for it. Maybe it's not, uh, sometimes we call it hidden places or hidden sites or non-visible. So for example, we have two boxes here, okay? In the first box, there is nothing written. It's like, a, it looks like this. It's like white, blank, okay? But actually there is a text inside this box, but the text is in white, but it's not visible. Okay, so it's not visible for everyone. You will never know what I'm uh, what I wrote in this uh, box um, unless you change the font color. But what about the next box here? Uh, if you uh, go if you go systematically, you will find a small uh, asterisk here at the corner. Okay, so apparently uh, some candidate may miss and they say this is a, like a blank box, but the other candidates who like examine every part in this box, like the central, the peripheral, the peripheries, the corners, will notice this asterisk. Okay, so if you have a system for examination, generally you won't miss any time. So if you examine, if you are examining the cornea and you are focused only on the central cornea, you can easily miss uh, pathologies in the limbus, very easily. Okay. So that's why we are trying in this course to give you a systematic way for examination in every station. So uh, this is again, uh, remember the scenario I told you uh, early, uh, this is an early band keratopathy. So you see, an early band keratopathy. So it's, you, you can easily miss this sign if you are focusing on the central cornea, especially if there is another sign, like obvious sign in the eye. Suppose uh, there is subluxation of the lens or uh, posterior capsule opacification. So you may think uh, you may th uh, you may think that this is the only sign, but actually there is another sign in the cornea which is early band keratopathy. So the key answer for this case, for example, this pseudopakia with band keratopathy and like this. But you said only pseudopakia, for example. So you missed the band keratopathy because you didn't check for the limbus. All right. So this is another example. Suppose you notice some signs in this eye, but you didn't retract the upper and the lower eyelid. See now, if we retract the lower eyelid, we will find a sign here. And if we retract the upper eyelid, we will find a sign here. So, so see how many signs you missed if you didn't if you didn't retract the eyelids. You have in the anterior segment station, for example, you have to retract the eyelids to examine the limbus. So there is a periphery. Uh, whether the periphery of the cornea or the periphery of the anterior chamber, okay? So can you uh, answer this sign, what we call this sign and this sign? Inverse, reverse, hypopion or hyper, hyper yes. And uh, what about the other sign here in the, yeah, Andrew, prefer I do. Uh, you may miss this signs and focus on aphakia or areas of atrophy. So you need to detect the eyes. This is the, the bottom line here. How about this case? We don't expect such a photo, uh, such a case in the exam because this is like a staining. Yes, of course. Yes, uh, this I mean green staining. Uh, in a, uh, you have to say there is area of dryness, and you know uh, some of you missed 
an important sign, but others uh, picked it. So here, as you can see here, this is a blood, punctal blood. So sometimes when we have a lot of signs, we can miss another sign because we didn't examine each part systematically. Okay. All right. Let's see some uh, points about apparently hidden plate. It's not hidden. The puncta is visible. Yes. Upper punctum or lower punctum, they are visible. But if you keep in mind to search for them, the crankle is not hidden. Okay. So one of the commonly missed area is limbus, crankle, lid margin. Okay. So lid margin uh, position like introbion, ectropion, or maybe polyosis, eyelashes, loss of eyelashes, some small mass, some ulcer in the lid margin. So tarsal conjunctiva, actually, uh, we, they don't ask you to avert the upper eyelid, but this is in, uh, in actual, in real practice. Sometimes we need to avert the upper eyelid to check for the upper tarsal conjunctiva, but at least the lower tarsal conjunctiva, the lower palpebral conjunctiva, every part of the palpar conjunctiva, you have to examine the conjunctiva, every part of the conjunctiva properly. The pupillary border, because sometimes there is some um, like uh, moist eating or like exfoliation material on the pupillary borders, you have to examine the pupillary border. Some of the commonly missed signs, uh, as I said before, contact lenses, prosthesis, uh, the area of the superior limbus and inferior limbus, um, anterior chamber depth and content, okay? Uh, upper lip, so the lip uh, uh, may be hidden uh, under the upper eyelid, the prefer eyelid to me, lens subluxation, like subtle subluxation, iris transillumination defects. So in order to see the transillumination defect of the iris, you have to do retroillumination technique. Okay, uh, crankle puncta, conjunctival scar. So suppose a patient underwent strabismus surgery, you can miss his conjunctival scar if you don't examine the conjunctiva. Cratoconus, if you don't check the cornea thickness, so one of the steps for assessing the cornea is to assess the thickness, the central thickness and the protrusion, so you can miss an early cratoconus. And don't forget, we are dealing with the whole patient. So we have to look at carefully for the face, the whole body, uh, any evidence of scars, uh, pigmentation in the skin, and so on. Uh, coming again to uh, why you do miss some clinical science, haven't seen it before. So the eye can't see what the mind doesn't know, of course. Okay, so in, in this uh, non-ophthalmic question, which flower is uh, the dandelion? If you don't know what does the dandelion look like, you can't answer this question, okay? Actually, it is not uh, there. It's not there among these flowers. Okay, so this is a uh, dandelion. So that's why it's very important, you know, to see a lot of cases, to study and see a lot of photos, uh, check atlases. So try to every uh, sign you read about. So suppose there is a sign but there is no photo for this sign. You can Google it and find the photo that depicts this piece of information. So you have a, a list of signs, but the book you are studying from um, doesn't show all this, uh, the photos for these signs. You can tell, okay? You can tell, you can Google and find how this each sign looks like, okay? Another reason uh, for missing some signs is to be caught by insignificant signs or we have like multiple signs and you are happy, you are like um, excited about finding some signs, but actually uh, you missed an important one. Or maybe you picked uh, an insignificant, irrelevant signs, but you missed the most important one. And I call it old man trap. So what I mean by this? And this is actually a common scenario. So I uh, I know it from one of the past kind of experience. So suppose this is a patient in front of you. All right. So you know, with aging, uh, a lot of changes uh, happen. Okay. So the candidate, she noticed um, things like that, like dermatocalysis, there is some ptosis. So by the way, what we call the ptosis in this old age, what we call it, so because it's not enough to say ptosis, you have to uh, to say specifically. Okay, so I like the one involutional ptosis. So try to avoid senile. So she, she noticed involutional and somehow the examiner was a bit, let's say, uh, not helpful. So 
so he he left her to assess the toes, okay, levator function, degree of toes. But then the examiner said the patient doesn't complain from toes. So this is like indirect clue that the toes is not the problem, the not, not the real problem in such patient. Then um, she noticed again the patient and okay, some some noticed nodular lesion, yes, uh, nodular lesion. I was trying to bring a closer case scenario, but uh, yeah, very important to point out the swelling. But if we come closer, she comes closer and she noticed like watery eye, okay? And actually there was some, some kind of uh, redness, okay? So there is some sort of irritation in us. And as you know, Toses per se, per se, it doesn't result in uh, red eye or, you know, uh, watery or like uh, apophora, okay? So there must, there must be another important sign she missed. So when she examined the patient again, of course, she wasted a lot of time, okay, in evaluating the stosis, which uh, actually is not required. She noticed uh, an ectropion. Again, it comes with aging, and we call it involutional ectropion. So the patient unfortunately um, had involutional ectropion. And actually, this is the answer key for this case. And um, she didn't pass the exam. Of course, this swelling will exaggerate the ectropion in this, on this side. But actually, she, there wasn't a swelling in her situation, just ectropion. Okay, there's other problems with aging here, but uh, the message here that uh, she missed, uh, at least at the beginning of the station, she missed ectropion, okay? And uh, she wasted the time in evaluating the process. All right, another reason, uh, we don't use the proper technique. And this is uh, especially relevant in squint evaluation or pupil or anything related to the neural station. So you have to do, uh, for example, you can miss REPD if you didn't perform pupil assessment correctly. You can you can easily miss it. So you have to know how to do the proper technique. Another example in the anterior segment station. So you can easily miss the transformation defect of the iris if you uh, didn't do trans uh, retroelimination technique. Okay. So uh, there is no place to ask the patient about the complaint. Okay. And this is why clinical station is challenging part of the exam. Another reason, inability to translate the findings into sign-based diagnosis. And you do, you do the cover test, for example, you, you found the recovery movements or movement, but you couldn't be able to give the, a diagnosis. You couldn't uh, say, is it, for example, exotropia or exophoria, you know? because you have a like lack or insufficient knowledge about correlating the findings with the diagnosis okay uh, it differs from what you have seen okay sometimes you you got used to see like a, a sign uh, in a established uh, picture like band keratopathy in the form of band but now in the exam you you saw like an, an opacity, faint opacity, like a line inside the limbus. So you are not accustomed to see such early cases. So maybe uh, it differs from what you have seen because sometimes diseases uh, varies according to the stages, uh, whether it is acute or chronic. Uh, sometimes uh, presence of complications can make the picture differs, okay? So suppose you, you are familiar with catacomas, but all of a sudden, you saw a patient with hydrops on top of catacomas. So this might be a challenge for you, okay? Sometimes the patient underwent surgery or uh, have taken medication. So uh, somehow it changed the appearance of the signs. Again, age and complexions um, maybe have an effect on the uh, appearance of the sign. And that's why, again, you have to see a lot of patients. You have to uh, see a lot of photos. And remember, uh, one diagnosis, so we have sometimes one diagnosis with different presentation. Some disease is presented by the complication itself, not uh, by the disease. So this is an example. We posted this before. Actually, this is a case of band keratopathy underwent a laser a PTK chelation, okay? Uh, we posted this as an old assignment. So actually, uh, patients like this, 
uh, it differs from bandic keratopathy you used to uh, to see uh, because it underwent chelation okay uh, and actually this is a case of uh, juvenile uh, you know anterior erythrocytitis because in children it's very easily to get uh, bandic keratopathy from anterior uveitis and we have a lot of signs like stoned pupil and vitiligo and polyosis and that's why it's important to while inspecting the patient even so this is even in the anterior segment station you have to uh, spend a few seconds before examining the patient on the slit lamp sometimes out of stress or fatigue you saw a sign but somehow you forgot to mention to the examiner or you were uh, unable to describe it okay and uh, sometimes it happens and again stress and fatigue another thing that some candidates who don't practice well or like sufficiently they are very attentive to to do the technique properly and they forget to elicit the signs they are focused in doing the test nicely but uh, they miss to pick the signs suppose they are doing uh, like motility testing okay like virgin testing they follow the instructions, but then they are uh, enabled to, to notice if there is any limitation or overaction of any muscle. And sometimes many reasons combined together to let you forget or to miss some signs. Coming now to the general checklist. I think the majority of you um, have watched this before. So this is a video uh, like imitating somehow the situation in the exam. A request for admission. So you allow to enter the station. Uh, the there is someone called the administrator who will allow you or will show you when to enter the station. Okay. It's no harm to say hello, hi, good morning. So this is the first part to greet the examiner and the patient. Next, uh, suppose this is an anterior segmentation. So anterior segmentation is all about slit lamp examination, okay? Again, you have to spend a few seconds inspecting the patient. That's why I wrote here in inspection, okay? Introducing yourself and consent usually is not required in the exam because the patient already consented before the station and they all know about you, you are a candidate. So there is somehow no need to introduce yourself or taking a consent. But if you want to say it, uh, it's no harm, I think. Uh, but uh, some candidates, when they are trying to introduce themselves and to take the consent, the examiner uh, most of the time will stop you and say, proceed, okay? Uh, go ahead. The disinfection in the exam, usually before entering the station, usually in the form of uh, hand gel, okay? But in this video, I, I used the hand wash. In, your, in real practice, we try to show the patients that we are keen about the infection control. So most recommend to show the patients that you uh, disinfect your hands, maybe swab the slit lamp before examining. Here I did a mistake, but supposedly before allowing the patient to put their chin on the chin rest, you have to adjust your slit lamp to make sure that as they focus on zero, for example, the IPD is correct. So uh, the adjustment and the refinement of the slit lamp uh, should be done before allowing the patient to put their chin on the chin rest. Okay. And I think Dr. Richie uh, Burma point this out in that in his exam, uh, the, uh, the slit lamp was out of focus. 
So he needed to adjust the focus in zero before examining the patient and the examiner uh, was happy for uh, seeing this. Okay, because maybe the, the previous candidate is first myopic or have a refractive error, or maybe the examiner intended to change the fo focus, who knows? Okay, so you have to be careful about the focus and the intrapupillary distance. Also, this is important in, in direct ophthalmoscope. Uh, so spend like a part of the second to make such um, adjustment before examining the patient. Here I'm stressing on examining both eyes. So if the examiner asks you to examine, generally you need to examine both eyes. But if they say specifically examine the right eye, make sure to examine the right eye because some candidates wrongly examine the left eye. So be careful about the side, which eye. Uh, if the examiner didn't specify, you have to examine both eyes. And again, you have to examine specifically, start by the lid margins, and the punk thumb. So here in this uh, clip, uh, I will ask the patient to look up to look for the inferior fornix, inferior tarsal area. <music> of course, you need to give instructions to the patients. You have to, uh, the only talk between you and the patient is about instruction and assuring the patient, but there is no place to ask any uh, history. And try to uh, spend your time examining the slit lamp very carefully because sometimes you uh, usually uh, you examine the patient's slit lamp, you have to pick all the signs, and sometimes the examiner will take you away from the slit lamp and discuss the finding. Uh, so there is no um, chance or no uh, opportunity to re-examine the patient again in slit lamp. Some examiner do this. They leave you until you finish, and then they ask you to come away, like away from the slit lamp, and they discuss the findings and, and the follow-up questions, okay? And it's very important to return everything into place. Don't leave the slit lamp like this. If you are using um, uh, plus 90, uh, you return it to the box. So return everything into place, and don't forget to thank the patient and thank the examiner at the end of the station. So this is, uh, I call it general checklist. It can apply to every case. Uh, like greetings, disinfection, choosing yourself, consent, instructions. Sometimes instructions uh, are given before starting the examination and throughout the examination. And don't forget, inspection is the first step in examining the patient before touching uh, or any maneuver uh, with the patient. And you have to document the finding in your head. There is no place to document the findings in in a notes or something like this, like in real, in real life. So in real practice, we document the finding in the, sheet, in the sheet or file or chart. But here you have to remember, remember. So you have to be calm and quiet and not stressed because you saw the signs, but uh, you are not able to memorize what you have seen, okay? And be ready, uh, be ready to discussion with the, the examiners and again, thanks to the patient and examiner. Uh, some people, or less in general, or some cultures, they are not used to use these words frequently. So like, sorry, uh, if you did a mistake or if you did harm the patient. So you have to, inspection is not only about uh, eliciting the signs, but also to see the response from the patient. If you notice that uh, the patient grimace or like annoyed by something, you have to say sorry, okay? So usually we describe the signs uh, after finishing the slit lamp examination, okay? Uh, not during the examination. So we don't speak in the slit lamp, in the anterior segment station, we don't speak while we are examining the patient. We don't say, uh, I, you, usually you finish the examination and then mention the signs uh, to the examiner. And also for anterior uh, posterior segment station, okay? 
So uh, when the stations, uh, when the station relates to a device like slit lamp, um, indirect ophthalmoscope, usually you finish the examination and then mention the sign away from the patient and away from the device. Okay. Okay, maybe there is some variation. Uh, so you, you have to be attentive what the examiner is saying. Okay, but in my case, and uh, many other candidates, they usually finish the examining the patient by slit lamp or in diet or cellmoscope or like uh, plus 90, and then mention the signs uh, away from the patient. So again, you have uh, to, um, to say sorry, okay? So practice saying sorry and practice saying please. So whenever you instruct the patient to do something, please look at the target, please look at the distance, please follow the target in testing the ocular motility, for example. So try to, to see these words more often. And uh, don't forget to thank the patient and everyone and be respectful. And respectful can be translated in many things like body language, eye contact, smiley face, and even in the way you're talking, okay? So you can, you can show disrespect by just a uh, face gesture, okay? Uh, so be respectful. Uh, regarding the handicare, uh, they should be clean. And uh, in winter time, you may have to warm them up. Short nails, uh, no nail polisher, of course, and try to be gentle, especially if you uh, see that there is some redness in the eye, you have to be gentle, okay? So this is a play time. Okay, so this is a fun time, uh, which is a role play. So I will play the role of the patient. Okay, and one of you will play the role of the candidate. And I will choose one of the active uh, members. Okay, so be ready, Pooja. I will show you what uh, we are going to do right now. So uh, try to be creative, all right? And I'll, I'll try to be creative. So imagine now you are the candidate and I am the patient, okay? So you will say uh, whatever greetings you want, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, and you have you have to wait until to until I reply. So it's not only it's not only saying something. You have to wait for replying. Okay, you are not a parrot. You speak and that's it. You have to wait for reply. So you say greeting and I will reply. Then you will introduce okay. yourself. Okay, you can say your uh, your real name or nickname, or fake name, whatever you like. You can say I am uh, uh, like a butterfly. It's okay, uh, but you have to say like two names, like your uh, first name and surname. And um, in order to show me that you care, you keen about this infection, you can you have to say, uh, let me first wash my hand, okay? And I will reply, okay. Uh, number four, taking the constant. Uh, so so you will say, I can can I examine your eyes? And I will reply, yes, of course. Number five, uh, this is my reply. Number six, um, instruction. So please, I want you to follow my instructions. This is like a like a general um, statement. Uh, and I will okay. reply, okay. Number seven, uh, look at this target, uh, the distant target, like examine the pupil. So look at the this, this target. You have to practice saying, please, please look at the target. You can change, you can say, please follow the target in testing the ocular motility. And number eight, um, during the core, uh, the test, you have to motivate me, to assure me. So whenever I follow your instruction, you will say, great, you are doing well, okay? And um, if you are going to touch me or like um, uh, to, to palpate anything, you have to say beforehand, this won't hurt you, okay? And um, okay. at the end, I will say something like, ouch, or something like that. So you will say, sorry, uh, did I hurt you? So I will reply, it's okay, okay. Number 10, you thank me okay. and I will reply, you're welcome. Okay, but above all, okay, we, we don't have camera on, but uh, to keep in your mind and you are you are doing all of this while inspecting you, uh, inspecting, sorry, inspecting me. Why inspecting me? To elicit some signs and also to say your, my response to your words. Okay, so in real practice, you can gather a lot of information by just inspecting the patient. You can, you know, you can know more about the personality of the patient as well and the accompanying person. Okay, let's start. Go ahead. Okay, ma'am.
ओके हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग आई एम डॉक्टर पूजा राय लेट मी फर्स्ट वॉश माय हैंड ओके ओके कैन आई एग्जामिन योर आईज ऑफ कोर्स थैंक यू दैट्स वेट um okay i will be asking you to uh, look at certain targets you have to follow my instructions so so sorry, sorry. Uh, please look at Wait. the distant object okay okay, okay. Yes. so you have is something uh, you have you should try to avoid this you can say uh, uh, please follow just go straight so go directly so please follow my instruction but you have you should you uh, you must try to avoid uh, this obligation okay keep going okay okay so, so look at the mirror in front of you please look at okay oh sorry please look at the mirror in front of you mm -hmm. oh uh, great um keep looking this won't hurt you i will be projecting a light on your eyes okay um ouch oh sorry is the light too bright does it hurt you uh it's okay now okay thank you so much for cooperating you're welcome okay great pleasure so uh when it comes to inspection i mean by inspection naked eye inspection because you know if you examining uh, slit by slit lamp you are inspecting the structures but you are using the slit lamp so we need this um, and it will you have to spend them much time doing this especially in oculoplastic station and neuro station and uh, in anterior segment station it's like a few seconds before examining the patient and posterior segment usually posterior segment you usually you you go directly into examining the family okay and again uh, if you deeply observe everything is your kitchen okay So don't ignore their receptive senses like listening and observing. Okay, we have like four skills. So listening, uh, listening carefully, and try to be active listener. So active listener means you listen and you react. Okay, and you think about what you are listening and observe. Be a good observant because sometimes we lose a lot of information by talking. Okay. and by uh, taking action without giving sufficient time for observing and listening i i um, sent this word before and most of you uh, agreed that um, usually the inspection naked eye inspection is used in oculoplastic and oculomotor disorders especially for nystagmus and strabismus so by inspection age and gender so this could be relevant so suppose you saw a proptosis but in a child it differs from proptosis in an adult or in old age okay so by inspecting you can have an idea about the age and uh, gender the same thyroid eye disease more in females so uh, this will help you in your listing your differential diagnosis you in so inspection starts by age gender general condition of the patient again if they are wearing glasses or prosthesis okay if there is any signs of redness watery eye uh, and when it comes to strabismus and nystagmus you have to notice for abnormal hip position okay uh, globe position proptosis nephthalmo dystopia eyelid position any signs suggestive of previous trauma or surgery the skin uh, you know hair any swelling in the body any pigmentation or depigmentation so there are a lot of points to be covered in inspection but don't forget age and gender okay sometime complexion so one of the common mistakes in clinical station you rush into examining the patient and not looking at the whole patient so you may fail to observe simple growth things like a scar of like like, like i i missed early in my station the scar of the external dcr or like uh, if the patient underwent to surgery you may miss the scar of the frontalis uh, sling or levator resection or even you may miss uh, mild uh, ptosis mild entropion mild ectropion and be careful of um, that the, most of the time there are multiple signs or multiple diagnoses 
So by doing this and practicing and like examine systematically, um, you uh, you will be proud of yourself. Okay. Um, next section is uh, study resources and advice. Um, this is some of the recommended books. You uh, usually study from Kaniski or any equivalent, uh, similar book, whatever you like, but sometimes you have to check um, books that target the clinical examination and viva station. Okay, so these are some of the examples uh, about uh, like Wong. Okay, you know Wong, this is an old book and uh, cake walk and also this book in the middle so i have uh, i have them in my uh, on my desk so because this is uh, helped me in in your in formatting the course actually and don't forget we have an important book uh, with multiple authors from different nationalities with different personalities which is called past candid experience you can gather a lot of information just by knowing the most, because you know the questions, questions are repeated. Cases are repeated. Yeah, there might be a, a new question, a couple of new questions or in Viva or um, some interesting new cases, but most of the cases, most of the questions are actually repeated, okay? And some of these books, are like they are talking to you, they are like an invisible person. So they give you some tips how to succeed in our exam. So I, I, I want to go through this slide, but let's say, have a comment on the first one, believe in yourself. How can you believe in yourself without sufficient preparation? So you have to be prepared very well to have a faith or to believe in yourself. So usually don't skip these steps because these steps are very important, but you have to, understand them well. Uh, this is an important point. Sometimes you need to uh, go the exam with some necessary equipment, okay? You can hold these small equipments in your um, in a small bag okay? or in your white coat uh, pouch. You know, uh, white coat is not um, oblig an obligation, but in my case, I went to the clinic station with my white coat in order, because I like the white coat, by the way, so uh, I don't know. But um, one of the advantages of white coat is that you can keep your tools inside uh, the recess of the pouch of the white coat. So again, you don't need to like overestimate or like... Uh, don't don't go to the exam with in that ophthalmoscope. This is not needed at all. But I mean small tools, uh, like convenient, accessible tools. This some of the uh, tools that you need to uh, have in your exam. This is like a general list. But uh, later on, we will specify uh, what the benefit of each of each one of them according to the station. So at least you need to have like a, a pair of pintosh just in case one doesn't work. Or maybe you have to like uh, lend another one to your another candidate. So pintosh is important. For example, for strabismus, you need to have an occluder accommodation target, all right? But having said that, supposedly everything should be available on the exam day. But uh, personally, I prefer to go with the exam with this uh, kind of stuff, okay? I will skip some slides, all right? But I will keep them in the recording. The worst scenario in the clinical station is this one. Making up a clinical sign is worse than missing a sign, okay? So I, I have just one example in my mind, but this is from Viva. So you, uh, some candidate was given an ECG, a strip of ECG, uh, actually it was normal ECG, but he uh, said uh, there is an ischemic changes. So now uh, you are making up a sign. So of course he wasn't sure about this, but he wanted to say something. Uh, so he mentioned there is an ischemic change and, you know, but actually it was a normal ECG. So and when it comes to, to ECG, uh, I think this is my, uh, my myth that 50% they are normal ECG, okay? And 50%, there is something like ischemia or atrial fibrillation, something like obvious, okay? So making making up a sign, like imagining a sign is worse than missing the sign. So suppose this patient has a normal ECG, but you said this is an ischemic change. 
this will change the scenario. So you are like a dangerous practitioner, okay? This means that you can go by your sense rather than by facts. And this is very harmful when it comes to medical practice, okay? So if you are not sure, at least you can say, I'm not sure, I need to ask a physician, something like this, but don't confidently say there is something and there is nothing like this, okay? Uh, again, don't forget to check the website. Uh, it depends on the exam. So uh, if we are talking about the, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and the Surgeon of Glasgow, you have to check the website to know about the format of the exam, their instructions. Uh, once you uh, secure the seat in the exam, you have to follow the, uh, to read the emails, all the emails you get in your mailbox, okay? Um, don't ignore some simple things like the dress code. Okay, uh, so in order to be, uh, uh, to be a fellow, the Royal College Fellow, you have to follow your instructions, okay? If you are not convinced with their instruction, uh, don't appear for the exam. There are, there are many alternatives, okay? So for example, uh, this photo quiz for, uh, for males, uh, for gentlemen, which one uh, or which uh, photos uh, are in line with or following the dress code for men for the exam? We have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, someone said four is acceptable. Uh, our course for clinical, okay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Heba. So uh, the dress code for clinical differs somehow from the viva. Um, since we are our course in about clinical, so I mean the dress code in clinical, okay, in clinical. Uh, okay, someone said one is the acceptable one. Okay, so this reminds me uh, reminds me of uh, you catching one sign, and actually there is multiple signs. Okay, so there is uh, actually two acceptable um, dress code for men uh, in, in during the clinical exam. Number one and number three, okay, because according as uh, the, the you can uh, wear a short sleeve or you can um, roll the long sleeve uh, above elbows, okay. So one and three are the acceptable one, and uh, number four, uh, someone said number four, tie is not required um, in the clinical station, and uh, this polo shirt is uh, considered as. Um, underdressed or like very casual, okay? Um, this is not accepted. And number two is overdressed. So being overdressed and, uh, you know, you show you have, you have a lot of money. And actually this may be interfere with your flexibility during examining the patient, okay? Especially with invalid of salmon school. So tie and uh, jacket and things like that. So don't be overdressed, I think, uh, in viva and clinical. So the examiner should be the only one who all, who should be overdressed, actually. actually. So let's uh, come to the dress code. So as you can see, no tie, so no tie. And um, T-shirts and polo shirts are not acceptable. And uh, according to, uh, as a inflation control, arms to be bare below the elbow, all right? For uh, women, uh, this is the acceptable way for hijab, but this is uh, not allowed. One of the etiquettes or one of the instruction uh, that you don't need to communicate with other colleagues or other candidates during the exam, okay? You should not communicate with each other during the examination or between examination stations. Patients are changed after every session. You should not discuss the patients you have seen with candidates who have still to be examined as this is not helpful and can cause confusion. You have to be aware about the personnel in the exam, uh, the setting of the exam. It's very important to know what to expect on the exam day. There is someone, uh, administrator, and we have examiners, we have observers, okay? The administrator will advise you of the fire evacuation procedure and location of the toilets. You will be placed outside your first station and advised which station it is. The administrator will inform you when you should enter the station. You should not enter the station until advised by the administrator. After each station the administrator will organize you for the next station and advise you 
which station it is. You should not enter the station until told do so by the administrator. There may be an observer in the clinical station. The observer will not examine or provide marks on your performance. You should follow the examiner's instructions. And this is not is important because it's not allowed to communicate with the patient with anyone except in English. Okay. So suppose the uh, the patient speaks Arabic and you are uh, like uh, Egyptian, so you are not allowed to speak to him in Arabic. Even giving him an instruction in Arabic is not uh, is not allowed. So you have to speak in English, and there will be like interpreter to uh, let the patient understand. Okay. One of the important exam etiquette I will mention only one is that once you finish the exam. You have to leave the examination center immediately without talking. Just thank you and that's it, okay? And uh, when all else fails, half fails. Coming down to the last part, uh, which is the closing slides. This is actually the, uh, the results of one of the most dedicated candidates and I'm very sad for her result. So he passed anterior segment, posterior segment, neuro. So neuro is the most challenging. He passed it, but he he got fail marks in two fail marks in the oculoplastic disorders. So it was surprising for me because personally I think that oculoplastic is the easiest one. Maybe because this is my one of the strongest area, but um, that's why I posted this uh, vote uh, a couple of days ago and. Most of you said that uh, neuro and oculomotor disorder is the most difficult one followed by oculoplasty. So our ne next talk uh, will be um, targeting uh, one uh, topic related to uh, oculoplastic station, which is proptosis. So imagine now you enter the oculoplastic station and you notice proptosis. What are what is the state checklist? What are the points to be assessed? and some of the scenarios and uh, questions and answering some questions related to proptosis. So um, next presentation will be about assessing a proptosis and uh, of course with dystopia, if, with or without dystopia, orbital dystopia. So what is the assignment? So the assignments is now it's your uh, turn. Your assignment is to revise um, chapter the orbit from Kaniski or, what, or whatever book you like. If you are studying from Kaniski, don't forget the trauma because in trauma chapter, we have orbital trauma, blowout fracture. So you have to revise them. And if you have enough time, if you have still enough time, you can um, revise what are the points to be evaluated in a case or with proptosis. Okay, so this is your assignment. This slide is for those who didn't pass the exam before, who attempted the exam before but failed it. So the road to success and the road to failure are almost exactly the same. Uh, this is a confusing somehow, but it's all about that you prepare for exam, but somehow you failed the exam. This doesn't mean you have to stop. You have to keep preparing again, start again, continuing your preparation. Hopefully, slow and steady, you will win the race. So keep going, going upstairs, uh, and hopefully you will uh, achieve the success you want. Post meeting reflection, you have to post like one single sentence, important uh, sentence you learned from today's presentation. And that's all I have. Uh, thank you for attending the meeting and I'll see you uh, in the next meeting uh, about orbit, specifically proptosis. Okay, thank you. Candidates with religious or cultural reasons for not observing the dress code will be expected to comply with the dress code in those rooms involving the physical examination of patients. In line with current UK infection control practices, the dress code requirements for the clinical examination are as follows. Arms to be bare below the elbow. No jewellery on hands or wrists with the exception of wedding rings or bands. No tie. An acceptable form of dress would be a conventional short-sleeved shirt, open at the neck, 
or for a long-sleeved shirt with the sleeves rolled up throughout the examination. T-shirts and polo shirts are not acceptable dress. White coats are not required. For the purposes of visual identification and to facilitate the assessment of non-verbal communication skills and interaction with the examiner and patient, the college reserves the right to require candidates to remove any clothing and or other item which covers all, or part of, the candidate's face. The college will observe sensitivity in the visual identification of candidates. Formalities Ensure that you have adequate amounts of sleep and rest, and rest in the lead-up to the exam. Dress professionally on the day of the exam. Do not forget to alcohol gel your hands before examining each patient. Arrive at the exam venue in good time. It's expected that you have prepared yourself for the examination, and not there for a rehearsal. Practice examination routines. Develop your own system for examining. The anterior and posterior segment with the slit lamp. The posterior segment with the direct ophthalmoscope. Practice viewing the optic disc in non-dilated pupils and indirect ophthalmoscope. Eyelids. Orbits. Pupils. Confrontational visual fields. Practice examinations at every opportunity again and again before the OSCE. When you go into the OSCE, you should appear as though you have performed your examination of each system of the eye hundreds of times previously, ideally and hopefully because you have. Write down your notes and study smarter. Develop your own system for examination techniques. What the examiners are looking for. The examiners need to be satisfied that you are a safe, competent doctor, suitable to be an independent consultant general ophthalmologist. They are not looking for in-depth subspecialty knowledge. They are not looking for the next professor of ophthalmology. They do not want to see arrogance on the day of your exam. They respect a friendly and confident manner. Examiners come with a wide range of personalities. Do not worry about what sort of examiners you get. They are not trying to catch you out, but want to find out what you can do and know. Examining Patients be nice and treat patients with respect at all times. Always introduce yourself to the patient and ask the patient for permission to examine them, unless you've been told that the patients were pre-consented. Ensure patient is positioned correctly before you begin, example, ensure correct position of a patient on a slit lamp before beginning to examine the anterior segment. Don't look for feedback from the examiners. Whilst examining patients, look for signs, decide how best to interpret the signs and think about how you will present your findings to the examiner. Tell patients what you will be doing, smile and show that you care. Say thank you to the patient at the end of your examination. Examining and Presenting Listen carefully to the examiner's instructions and just examine what they have asked you to examine. If in doubt clarify with the examiner. Try to avoid the running commentary approach while examining that a patient unless the examiner asks you to do it. The vast majority of examiners prefer you to present your findings at the end of the examination. A running commentary slows you down and may disrupt the flow of your examination routine. Have a structured approach to presenting your findings to the examiner. Practice describing your findings. Your technique, findings, and interpretation are all under assessment. Have a structured approach to presenting your findings to the examiner. 
describe what you have seen. Make sure you are honest. Do not ever make up signs. Give the examiner either what you think is the diagnosis or two or three differential diagnosis, start with the commonest things first before mentioning the rarities. If the diagnosis is uncertain, describe what else you might have expected to find in support of your differential diagnosis. State what else you could do to help resolve the issue, history, further examination, investigations. Remember that even if you don't know a diagnosis for a case, you can still give a good structured answer and pass. Answering examiner's questions. Listen to the questions. Answer the question that you have been asked. Take a moment or two to gather your thoughts before answering the questions. Maintain eye contact with the examiner when talking, and not at the floor. Speak clearly and succinctly. Do not speak too quietly or too quickly. Try to give a well-structured answer to the questions. Be confident in your answer if you think you are right, but do not argue with the examiner. Avoid emotive words like senile in front of patients. The examiner may ask, are you sure, in response to your answer. Have a think about your answer and do not feel afraid to stick to your answer or afraid to retract statements you feel were wrong. If you do not know the answer to question, be honest and say so. Really important that you avoid saying anything that you would pose a danger to patients. When you think things are going wrong, Remember that difficult cases are likely to be difficult to all candidates. Remember that difficult questions often reflect a good performance. Each case of an OSCE station is marked separately. Try to stay positive if you feel you have performed badly in a case. I know this is easier said than done. A poor performance in a station doesn't necessarily mean that you will fail the exam overall. Try to maximize your marks in every case for every station. Tips to succeed in oral exam and OSCE Believe in yourself. You need to feel as comfortable as possible, psychologically as well as physically. Be courteous to examiner as well as your patient. Listen to question carefully and answer while looking into eyes of examiner. Answer must be well composed and short but comprehensive. Describe picture and demonstrate clinical findings clearly and confidently. Do not create any doubt in your answer. Be ready with common differential diagnosis. Intend to inquire about history, other findings, and tests done to narrow down the differentials. Then focus on working diagnosis. Plan to assist and manage, including conservative treatment alternatives. Do not forget patient and family education, drug side effects, genetic counseling. Follow up plans, and the prognosis of the disease in your management plan. Offer to consult seniors and other physicians of different specialties if required for continuity of care. Always lead the examiner to the next question yourself. Practice coping with more predictable opening questions. Examiners are always impressed by insight. Tailor your revision style to the exam style, practice questions and answers, and remember that the examiners really want you to do well.